Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right. So rock on. Here we are. Varun, my friend, how are you? You are in a different location for today's chat. I am. I'm in San Diego, and I know I did not want to talk about the weather, but I have to because it is so unfortunate that I am here this week. It's 60 degrees, 55 maybe, um, as good as Boston. We're trying to go get away from the cold, but here we are, same weather as in Boston. Um, and next week it's going to be in 80s, 90s, maybe. So I'm mm-hmm. just a little, yeah. Stay on but vacation an extra week. We are <laughs> seriously thinking about that, maybe. But I yeah. Mean, so anyways, uh, who, who do we have today? I think we should get back to the podcast and not talk yeah, about Yeah, because I'll just sit like here and make fun of you. <laughs> yeah. No, don't. It's All right, good. We'll move on then. So today's guest, um, today's guest is the founding president and co-founder of the Metro West Women's Network based here in Massachusetts, which I happen to be a member of. So I'm going to give a shout out there. Um, she's 40 under 40 uh, from the uh, awarded from the Worcester Business Journal, also based in Massachusetts. In 2020, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in our conversation. She is the chief operating officer of Vision Advertising, Julia Becker Collins. Welcome to the program, to the podcast, to the episode. Thank you. Thanks for having <laughs> me. <laughs> And uh, yeah, as uh, while we won't talk about the weather, um, we were okay. discussing desserts earlier, so we may come back to that. You know, this this group here and our preference between sweet and salty, but that that remains to be seen. Um, so we're gonna start myth busting. Question here: What sort of myth would you like to bust? What sort of bogus strategy or misconception would you like to set the record straight on? Um. So. I had been debating whether or not I was going to do something funny, but I think my favorite myth to bust with um, business, especially since we're having conversations that I want to um, help other agency owners with, is uh, the relationship between sales and marketing. A lot of agencies, a lot of corporations struggle with the relationship between sales and marketing, and they're often siloed. um, And oftentimes people think they should be siloed, but really what they should be is thought about as a Venn diagram. And I actually just had this conversation yesterday with somebody where I was trying to explain that the two departments really often fight with each other, but they need to understand that in order to succeed, they need to be almost holding hands and that one does better when the other one does better. And that their success is really relying on each other. So you're not competing with each other, but you're helping each other. So if you think about that Venn diagram, the overlap is where the happy place is. Or if you think about it as holding hands, they're doing better when the two departments work together. And why why is that? Why do you think um, they have to, well, where is the overlap? Let's say, let's understand that because traditionally, sure. you know, they have been working as a separate teams, you know, sales, marketing, they do all things yeah. and marketing would, you know, do the organic traffic and bring the marketing qualified leads. But as like in today's economy, today's businesses, they are trying to get it together. But, you know, it would be interesting to hear where do you see the overlap, what they need to do to, uh, make them well together as a team? Yeah, I mean, the overlap is in a lot of places, but if you think about kind of a traditional sales funnel, marketing is really responsible a lot of times for the top of the funnel and sales is responsible for further down the funnel. Obviously I'm simplifying here. Um, And what happens is that oftentimes sales feels like they're not getting the credit for everything. You know, you're not bringing in what you should be bringing in, saying this to marketing. 
or they're because sales is so reliant on every single sale that they're making because their bottom line, their personal bottom line, you know, how they get paid is really reliant upon every single sale that's coming in. There's that competition that happens with marketing or they feel like marketing is not doing enough. Why is this department even here? We should be spending more on sales practices, et cetera. And then on the marketing side, they feel like they're not being heard. They're not being appreciated because, you know, in marketing, what happens, whether you're having this conversation with a sales department or having this conversation with a potential client, people want to know, okay, well, if you do this with marketing, where am I going to get the sales? And sometimes what happens with marketing is you do thing over here and then squiggly line happens and you make a sale. It's not necessarily a direct correlation and sales teams can't often understand that. But we know that in marketing, if you don't do the thing, the sale doesn't happen. There is a connection between the two, but the way that the two departments often think are so disconnected, they have a hard time understanding how to get along. Um, before I was with Vision Advertising, I was with another agency and I was not only the only woman in senior leadership, I was the only person in marketing. <laughs> so I was the internal marketer for a marketing agency, marketing and marketing agency, and me and the sales team, this was like the constant butting of the heads. They couldn't understand why I even had a job because all that money could be spent on more trips for VIPs to take them to Celtics games versus I didn't understand why they wouldn't just look at Salesforce and put things in properly, you know? So to actually figure out to how to have those conversations together and get to a place where they were like, oh, wait, maybe what you are doing is really helping. And if we actually, you know, moved the leads forward in Salesforce, everybody would understand what's going on. So you're not just pulling numbers out of thin air in the meetings. We could all get along better. Let me follow up that up with, so there's, you know, a lot of the agencies that we chat with are, are you know, some tend to be, you know, in the tens. Um, sometimes they have in the hundreds in terms of employees, but when you're starting out, you don't always have both departments. You know, you tend to have to make a decision. Marketing person usually comes first, although that could be debated. Um, <laughs> some agencies hire sales first and go, oh crap, we did it funny. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts around, you know, with uh, founder led. Uh, sales teams, how do you see that Zen, that Venn diagram working? What advice might you have? Maybe some mistakes that you've, I feel like there's some good stories in there in terms of how you've seen it work and how you've seen it not work. I think that would be, a, this has been a, in the season three that we've been doing with agency owners, this has been a hot topic actually in, in a good way. There's a lot of conversation around, you know, obviously marketing is near and dear to my heart in terms of how we, we do this sort of thing, but is is having a sales team the right way to approach it? Is having a marketing team the right way to approach it? What if you don't have one of those departments? So totally. Yeah. I mean, it happens think? all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And we at Vision Advertising definitely went through that. So for a number of years, we were founder led sales team. Our CEO was the sales team. And we were definitely suffering from a case of the um, cobbler's children have no shoes. So we didn't do marketing for ourselves. And I can, you know, I can see you nodding your head. And I'm sure a number of people listening to this can understand this as well, that, you know, the marketing agency never does marketing for itself. And that is a very common theme that happens across the board. And I always tell people when they go to our website, I'm so sorry, it's so bad. <laughs> like, you know, and it's an upgrade from what it used to be. So for many years, we didn't do any marketing for ourselves, but we did sales. And so everything we brought in was really sales heavy and not marketing heavy at all, except we're a marketing agency. So we absolutely were victims of that as well. And then we pivoted and really needed to be doing both. And so what we did is myself and our CEO, before she retired, we crafted a marketing plan. We really sat down and crafted a plan with strategy to have the staff execute and so we didn't hire a team. We internally executed our own marketing strategy and we treated ourselves as a client. And we said, we need to prioritize ourselves just as we would prioritize a client, because if we don't, this is never going to happen. We need to think about who our ideal client is, 
who we need to be selling to, who we want to be selling to, who's a great client we already have, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing we would be doing for a client and kind of pivot as we see what's coming in. And then that way, what's happening on the sales side can be complemented by what's happening on the marketing side. So then we really did see results of, okay, so not only are we bringing in leads and new clients on the sales side, we are also bringing in new clients on the organic marketing side, people Googling, people finding us because things like this, where they hear us on podcasts, people finding us because of at the time it was workshops, now it's webinars, et cetera, et cetera. And the sales team can then pick that up and move that forward. So how we have it structured now is that I lead the sales team. We have other people on sales and then we have people executing marketing as well. I'm not the only person who does public speaking, but those people, so like, for example, my communications manager, she does a lot of public speaking for us as well, but she doesn't move sales efforts forward. If something comes in, she passes it off to the sales team. There are certain people on the sales team that only bring in to a certain point on the funnel, and then I can close. So it's a strategy based on who has different strengths, but thinking about your question about what a smaller agency should do, if it's a founder-led sales um, thing, you know, it's hard because you can only prioritize so much and, you know, you only have so much time and so much money. But the thing you want to be keeping in mind is that when you are prioritizing sales and not marketing, you are missing out on an opportunity. So even if you bring on an intern to run your marketing, it's more than you were doing before. If you are a marketing agency and you're not doing your own marketing, my suggestion would be to create a marketing plan like we did for our marketing and start marketing yourself and prioritizing yourself as a client so that you don't drop the ball and be like, well, I'm going to deprioritize this because it's just us. Um, I have a question on, you mentioned that um, I think it is also more towards what part of the marketing, like what do you do as a part of marketing to move the lead forward in the sales funnel? You mentioned that sales and marketing are always, you know, uh, conflicted and they don't agree to each other, which is true, but now, and then you mentioned they don't, they need to understand once the lead is in, they need to nurture them. I think when it comes to the nurturing, that's where the marketing comes in. So what are those things that you have done or you recommend people to do as a part of the nurturing program um, to move the leads forward in the, in the pipeline? So it really is dependent and I, people always hate this answer. Like it depends, but it really is dependent on what you're selling, who you're selling to, how big you are, et cetera. But I can tell you things that we're doing. So if it's a higher value lead and they really need some love and attention, that's more of a personalized touch from me checking in. Hey, we have this blog. I thought you'd be interested in this, you know, excuse me, if it's something that can be done in person, that's, you know, an opportunity to take them out for drinks, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of a classic sales move. But if it's more on the marketing side of just needing some touch points, that's where something like an email marketing can come into play, you know, getting that more regular touch point of, oh, this is what's happening with us. We like to do things like, you know, those free learning opportunities. Hey, we're doing these um, webinars, totally free. It's on a topic we thought you'd be interested in. You could be doing that by email marketing, but also you could be doing that with a personalized email that's being sent out from somebody on the marketing team. And that's why things like a CRM are great because you can see where in the funnel somebody is, how many touch points they've received, who else has reached out to them, have they responded, what else is going on in the sales process? And it's like, oh, okay, you're talking about, I'm spitballing here, social media. We're presenting this free session on social media. I'm going to send them a personalized email about that as a touch point to help nurture that forward and so that they feel loved and cared for. I, I don't know. One of the biggest things I always say to people is, you know, I know a CRM is so incredibly expensive, especially if it's Salesforce, but there's a million ways you can kind of slice that up. You could get something free. You could 
use a project management software and use it as a CRM, but something to track all the data so multiple people know what's happening with those leads is really helpful to help nurture things forward in the funnel. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, uh, just one last comment before we switch uh, topic. I think one thing that we did uh, in our, our team was um, making use of the LinkedIn sales navigator recently, which has started giving us a great result. Uh, the way we used it, I think it's a great way for, for any agency to touch base and stay connected with their, with their clients is, uh, you know, in sales navigator, there are plenty of filters. The filters that we started using, there are few, like one, if the owner, if my target account has posted a job that we are looking for some you know, this need, we have this need, right? That gives us, I'm talking about our agency, like from our perspective, we work with agencies that they're technology partners. So we are looking for them when they have a need for a, for a resource designer or developer. So we tell them, or we, we have those filters, as soon as they post something, that gives us a connection point. Like this is something that they have updated. So we should go and touch base at that point. If we are talking to an enterprise, bigger agency or bigger, bigger company, um, you know, Fortune 500, we look for people at higher up in the, uh, in, the, in the tree where if they have switched jobs recently, so we want to work with senior product manager, for example, if they have switched job in last three months or six months, chances are they're going to make some changes in the organization. So if they are looking for some change, that gives us another checkpoint and trigger that allows us to make a connection with those people. So those are little things that tools like Navigator has, has uh, come to us as an immense value, um, which I just want to highlight. I think that has been very helpful for us. Nice. I'll also chime in there from an agency perspective too, understanding, um, understanding how sales sells. You know, if you're in marketing and how marketing chooses to market, I think you said it earlier or in part of our prep conversation is around the communication before, between both departments. Like healthy friction is good, but y'all should be talking to each other. If you're not, there's a bigger issue. Why did that one close? Why didn't that one not close? You know, and just going through and, and having anecdotal chats, you know, what's the word that you use? Maybe we change the word. Maybe there's a different way to describe what we do. So I think there's a, it's a, it's a, for any kind of agency, it's an important piece to kind of address as they're, they're working through things. So, but that's a good myth. I like that one. We, we've chatted about it a lot. So with at Vision Advertising, you know, let's talk a little bit about you guys and, you know, your superpower. Uh, one of the the chats that we have with a lot of folks on this podcast is around, you know, process, culture, people, some of the important, how do you keep people motivated? How do you keep them doing their best work? What do you guys tell us a little bit about, you know, how you guys function, how you found it to be, to be able to grow and be successful that way? Sure. So I would say, yeah. Maybe what, what didn't work. <laughs> That's let's be honest, that's literally what we all want to hear. Like sure. what are the mistakes y'all made? Because that's what we want to talk about. <laughs> um, so I would say that um we have two things that are our superpower if I really have to like filter it down to that. One is how we communicate. And it's both internally with the team and externally with our clients. And we really pride ourselves on being transparent, honest, and open. And that doesn't work for everyone. I'm going to be really clear about this because people think it's like the most amazing thing in the world. And then they either come to work for me or they become a client and they're like, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes here. I didn't realize this is what you meant, like this level of honesty. And I'm like, yes, this is really what I meant. Transparent, open, honest communication. So what does that mean? So when you work for me, it's there's no, you know, office politics. There's no wondering what I mean when I say anything. What you see is what you get. You get immediate feedback, whether it's constructive or positive. You don't wait for an annual review. There are no annual reviews. You get to know what's going on immediately, which means you need to be prepared on a daily basis to get feedback. You need to be prepared in a group setting to get feedback from anybody. Thick skin. Thick skin. I, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
I had somebody that worked for me that said the best way to understand working for Julia and vision advertising is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it's really true. So it's exciting. You learn a lot. You have a lot of opportunities to grow as a professional. The job is as big as you want to make it. We're a small company. So there's huge opportunities to grow and expand. We always want to open up opportunities for professional development. If you say you want to learn something new, we'll create that opportunity for you. Your voice is always heard at the table. You know, there's not a lot of levels between the lowest person and the highest person. There's not a lot of red tape. You know, it's, you should always say what you're thinking, but you're always going to get feedback. So, but the nice thing about that is you just can kind of move through your day and you know what's going on. I'm going to, you know, organize myself the way I want. We hire adults that know what they're doing. We have flexibility in our work schedules. We offer unlimited PTO and we really want people to use it because we trust you to do your jobs. Weird. So you're right? hiring adults. <laughs> and we are hiring. <laughs> um, but because of that, it's, you know, get your job done and go enjoy the rest of your life. But if that means that it's a really busy week, then it's a really busy week. And if it's not as busy a week, then it's not as busy of a week. And so all of that kind of flows through this idea of open, honest, and transparent communication. Tell us what's going on. Tell us what you need. Be open and honest and transparent about your needs. Do you have a doctor's appointment? Are you having difficulty at home? Are you distracted today, et cetera, et cetera. On the client side, it's the same thing. And we have these conversations during the sales process and also throughout our relationships with our clients. What's going on? How can we help you? We made a mistake. Let us fix that for you. We don't just cover it over. They tell us if they're having a problem. We want to help them. One of the things that we did at the beginning of the pandemic that was incredibly well received with our clients is that we spent a lot of extra time at the executive level having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our clients about how can they help their businesses get out of everything that was going on because we run a business, so we get it. We genuinely want them to succeed. And because we have this open, honest, and transparent conversations with everybody, we've established these great relationships. They understand that we're not just saying it to sell them something. Part of that is also that when they say to us, hey, we're thinking of adding this to our plan. We know that you're a full service marketing agency. Can we do this? We can say to them, well, yes, that looks great, except that I don't think that's going to work for you. So I can take your money but let's try something else instead. And when you have those conversations with people, they trust you more because I could say to you, yep, let's do that. Sign on the dotted line, pay here. But really at the end of the day, what I want is for you to succeed. So that theme really runs through the whole company. It's that I want our clients to do well. I want the staff to do well. And a lot of that comes through the communication. There's no BS. It's really what you see is what you get with us. So that's one of the biggest things about vision advertising. And so that's why we've had clients that have stayed with us for over a decade. And they're very excited about what we do. We had clients that signed on for multi-year contracts in the middle of the pandemic because they really wanted to stay with us. And that's a big part of how we've grown is because of gaining all of their trust and we say when we make a mistake, and they say when they make a mistake. And I think that's hard as adults in business. It's true. So, so I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. No, I was just going to comment that, you know, helping um, employees and clients um, setting up, setting them up for success is, uh, and, and to do that, you need to communicate clearly. And that is something we have learned along the way as well. But I would love to hear from you, how do you set those expectations or communicate in the beginning? So when you have a new hire, right? The biggest mm -hmm. challenge is to make sure they know what they're supposed to do. Like, you know, yes, we have this job profile, but what does that actually mean? I mean, giving constructive feedback along the way is great, but before that, I think, how can we ensure that they know what they're supposed to do? Do you have any tactics or anything that you do, which allows them to be very clear about 
what are they supposed to do every day? Sure. So our hiring process is maybe a little bit different than other companies. I really, really believe in hire slow, fire fast. Even in an economy where you're just like, it's hard to hire, you're not finding the right person. It is one of the most expensive things you can do as an entrepreneur and as a business owner is hiring staff. So taking your time in finding the right person for the job is one of the best things that you can do. Don't just find a warm body that can fog a mirror. It is not going to work out in the end. So part of it is screening. Part of it is figuring out your process for screening. What are you asking in the application process? Why are you asking those things? Half the time, the questions I ask are not about the answers. It's about how you answer. It's about your thought process. So for example, I want to know if you can follow directions. So I ask for five references in the initial application. If you don't provide five references, then you can't follow directions. It's not about the five references. It's about following directions. So it's screening and setting expectations from the initial point of here is where we are. I expect things to be done at a very high level. So now we've reached, we've gone past the initial application. We're having a phone call. I am, I'm exactly like this on the phone. Hi, how are you? Is this a good time? I don't set an appointment. I just call. What are you like when you are being surprised by a phone call? Because marketing is a very fast business. So what are you like when it's unexpected? Does it go to your voicemail? Is your voicemail set up? Do you return my call quickly, right? Like, so there's a lot of layers to this. You can't just think about it as like an external, you know, recruiter is dealing with everything. You need to be invested in this. Okay, so now you're gonna have them do a writing prompt because most of marketing is writing, right? So you wanna know before you spend lots of money on this person, how do they write? How is their grammar? How's their long form writing? How's their short form writing? Can they do it while they're sitting in front of you under pressure, right? Like there's a lot of stages to this. Have people on the team interview them because it's a small company. What do they think about them? And I am very clear during the interview process. We're a small company. I care more about how you think and how you answer questions than can you already do the job? Because I can teach you how to do the job. That's not the problem, but I can't teach you to problem solve. And I can't teach you to think on your feet. And I can't teach you to, like if you're doing social media, I can't teach you to understand dad jokes. I'm not good at doing social media because I don't do dad jokes, but either you have that sense of humor or you don't have that sense of humor. So that's what I'm screening for. And then setting expectations is I am from go saying like, okay, so here's the next assignment to get to the next stage of the interview. I expect it to be in a PDF. I want it to be by this date. I want, you know, you're really setting those high expectations from the beginning. And are they meeting them? And if not, then they're not going to work out for you. And having, again, transparent conversations with a person it should be a two-way street. They should want to work for you. You should want them to work for you. How does this feel? Are you enjoying the process? Did you have questions about this? Let me tell you what it's like to work for me. Let me tell you what the job is like. Just break down the walls of like these, I have to ask you these 10 questions. Have a real conversation about it. So here's an example. So we're hiring for this new position. We have somebody that has decided to leave very amicably. So we're creating a new position and we're kind of rejiggering the whole team. And, but we're going to have the person who's leaving help to interview the new person, because ideally that's what you want to have happen so that he can say to them, this is what it's like to work here. Do you have questions about this? And then I have somebody else on my team who always helps me to interview people. And he's like, I'm going to tell you exactly what it's like to work here. And he does it unfiltered so that you're setting those expectations of, again, you know, I want somebody to work here because I want a new person on my team, but I want the right person on my team. But you should know this is what it's like in terms of the expectations, what the job is like, what the great things are, what the frustrating things are. No job is going to be perfect, right? 
And I want the person to get excited about it and to understand, here's what we want from you. You need to have a longer runway. That's where I have found the most success. What do you think is, you know, joking aside, what do you think is one of the big mistakes that you've made that you've learned from and you guys have pivoted? Um, whether it's hiring, whether it's, you know, sales and marketing, particularly running in agencies. Sure. Know. So a uh, number of years ago, we had somebody on the team that wasn't working out and it was through no fault of her own. It was a, I didn't hire her. She was already on the team when I came on board. Um, and she just, it wasn't a good fit. She shouldn't have been hired for the role. She, um, she just wasn't a good fit for the role for a number of reasons. Um, again, through no fault of her own. Um, it's, you know, I think that my understanding is there wasn't that long of a hiring process, that she wasn't that well screened, et cetera. What should have been done was that she should have been, you know, given a conversation. There should have been some kind of conversation around, you know, this is just not working. We're going to let you go, which again, hire slow, fire fast. Once you realize there's a problem, move on, have conversations with the team that's staying. But that isn't what happened um, because she was a good cultural fit for the company and people thought, you know, she had potential and kind of a lot of excuses were made. And I know this happens at other companies, which is why I'm telling the story. You know, she was moved into a different role. And it just, it was never going to work. The new role was more of a bad fit than the last role. And nobody had really had that transparent conversation with her about this is why it didn't work in the last role. And here are the expectations for the next role, et cetera, et cetera. It was just like, I felt very bad about the whole situation about it. She was just never set up for success from the beginning and all the way through. And I really wish what had happened is that we had ripped the bandaid off and been like, you know what, let's just part ways. And I have seen that happen at other companies where it wasn't me that was responsible for things. And I've seen it happen where I hear about people getting moved from role to role to role because it's just easier than firing them. But really in the end, you just need to be like, if this person isn't working out, they're just not working out. Yeah. On hiring, I heard um, you know, one comment by Mark Zuckerberg about when he interviews, I mean, it was, I, I was just, um, you know, it, it was interesting comment. He said, um, when I hire, when I interview people, I want to, I hire people who I want to work for. So mm -hmm. that is interesting way to look at it. You know, I mean, especially in this economy, you know, you know, hire slow that is where you you know the way you mentioned it's it's so important like you want to definitely hire the right person it has to be the right fit and the person has to be somebody that you really want to work with uh, so thinking like that is um was quite interesting for me to you know hear it's it's very true i really don't ever want to be the smartest person in a room i have no interest in it i've been doing this for over 15 years it's got to be longer at this point. Um, and I don't like being the smartest person in the room. I don't want to know everything. I want to hire people that know more than I do. So I might know the most about leadership, but somebody on my team is going to know way more than me about graphic design or SEO. Or I was presenting um, a live webinar two days ago. So on Tuesday to Center for Women and Enterprise. And this question came up because there was this Q&A session at the end. And they were like, well, so what do you, it was Instagram for business. And they're like, well, so what do you use to edit the videos? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't do that. <laughs> and so my communications manager luckily was in the audience. And so she was like, um, I can <laughs> answer that. I was like, great. Cause I have no idea. Like, I don't know because I don't do that. And I, I shouldn't know that because at my level, that's not what I'm involved in. And also I need people smarter than me that work for me. I don't want to know everything. I just, I should be surrounded by people smarter than me. An interesting point. It's like the, the running joke of whatever company and agency I've worked at and for 
um, or with is um, I love interns. I'm not allowed to manage them, but I love them <laughs> because they know so much more about what's cool yeah, and what's hot and what's more interesting. And, you know, I, it's, it's a, uh, they're wonderful. Like people use them to do grunt work, but they know what's coming. It's like someone once said 16 year olds run the internet. Um, 16 year olds run the internet in a yeah. lot of ways in terms of what's hot and what's not. And so, um, hello, rise of TikTok. Yeah. In particular. So, <laughs> but, um, I want to, uh, before, before we shift to you specifically, you know, what is, uh, if you had to pick one challenge that's keeping you up at night, you know, as an agency owner that, uh, you know, if you don't say sales, because <laughs> we all know we're, we're all there with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, but I think that was pre pandemic too. So it's just, I think, but I don't think True. that's unique to marketing. I was in fundraising before I got into marketing and bringing in money is going to keep anybody up that has to bring in money. So well, that's- business. <laughs> Correct. The bottom line, my friend, um, something that's keeping me up at night. Um, I would say, you know, one of the things I worry about, and I don't, it might be an irrational worry, but it's a worry is that, you know, we used to be in person as an office. And now for everybody on YouTube, you can see this is my lovely home office. Um, (laughs) And now we have chosen to be completely virtual um, because of the state of, you know, unknown World. things. Exactly. But the funny thing is that my staff actually wants to be in person. Everybody says, oh, millennials, they want to be remote, da, 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 except my staff's all millennials and they want to be in an office, except at the same time, we're all very concerned about the pandemic, et cetera, whatever. So yeah. I always worry about like, am I providing enough of the same experience for them in a virtual experience, but we don't have that kind of like, I can turn my chair around and ask you this question and Mm -hmm. we can all get drinks after work. And, you know, we're a small company. We really enjoy spending time together. So, you know, we're having conversations about doing some kind of co-working space in the future, et cetera, but it's just, it's not the same. And that's definitely one of those things where I'm just like, am I giving enough to them? Do they have what they need? you know, emotionally on that and side. It is, that's a very difficult yeah. question for the owners these days to, to answer because at one point you do want to provide for your employees, but at the same time, you have seen yes. that business has worked through the pandemic at, you know, without the cost of, you know, your office space. So, you know, if that expense is really worth it or not, it's difficult to, you know, find that right balance and like how much you want to spend on the, you know, uh, commercial space. So exactly it goes back to the whole, and we've had this chat with many owners, it's hybrid model, hiring models, like it affects all the things that, that are associated with that. So, but let's, let's, uh, let's pivot the conversation here for a minute. Tell us a little bit how you um, got into this business. Um, <laughs> I think you've got a, the quote you used earlier, of course, I can't remember it, but it was pretty funny. So I'll I let you tripped it. and fell face first. Into yeah, that marketing. was it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so most people, um, I present a lot to college classes and uh, professional groups. And the question I get most often is, you know, do you have a bachelor's degree in marketing? You know, did you go to school for marketing? And I didn't at all. I have no professional background in marketing in terms of like an educational background. My uh, bachelor's degree is in women's studies with a minor in art history. And then I have a master's in business and I went to law school for some time. So I know, but the other part of that is that I'm also older than I look. So in, there was no social media when I went to college. So if I did study marketing when I was in college, it would be so drastically different now that I don't know if it would have mattered. Yeah, they didn't um, teach metrics back then. Um, no, there we're wasn't. all of the, we're all older than we look. If that helps at all for context, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so they didn't exactly. teach that. <laughs> they didn't teach none of that. Either. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I really right after college, I um, 
was working as a, well, first an assistant property manager, but then a property manager for low income housing out in Western Massachusetts. And one of the issues they were having is filling all of the apartments. And they really suffered from the problem that a lot of businesses suffer from is we've always done it this way. So we're going to continue to do it this way. And they couldn't figure out why they were having so many problems filling all of the apartments when there is such a long wait list for section eight and section 136 apartments, they don't, you know, they're like, well, why would we need to market? There's a wait list. And I would just remember, you know, I'm 22 years old and I'm having a conversation with a CEO of a multi-million dollar company being like, well, something's not working. So Craigslist, <laughs> I know. I literally think that I like booked myself to sit at like tables for like people needing to rent apartments like a housing fair and I like made poster boards or something like that was marketing and I you know got us up on websites for apartments and I like had conversations with um different housing agents you know networking that's what I did and I filled up the entire apartment location within six months. And this is a company that has locations across the state. I think they're actually across New England at this point. And I was the only location that was full across all of their locations. And all of those property managers had are like lifetime property managers are in their forties. They've been doing it for decades and they couldn't figure out what a 22 year old had figured out that all of them hadn't figured out. And so then at some point they had me going around to all of the locations, training the other property managers how to market their locations. Again, having no degree in marketing and being at maybe 23 at this point. So then I went to law school, figured out that I didn't actually want to be a lawyer or pay the money to go to law school. And then I ended up doing a lot of nonprofit fundraising in Boston, about 10 years of it. And one of the things I discovered is that when you work at a nonprofit, you do about 10 jobs. <laughs> and so if you're in marketing, you're actually marketing, fundraising, major gifts, et cetera. Or if you're in fundraising, you're also marketing, et cetera. So I learned how to do marketing just by needing to do it because nobody else was doing it. I was a really, really large nonprofit and they didn't have any marketing. They didn't have a website. They didn't have a Facebook page. They didn't have a nothing. And it was just when things were kind of started getting busy with Facebook, all of that. And they needed to have some kind of online presence. I, you know, I started working on all of that. I worked on actually creating the website and working with a vendor to create the website. Um, I crafted sales promotions for them. I brought in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales. They had never had anybody do that for them. Um, I took a department that was deeply in the red and I moved it all the way to the black and it was funding three other departments. Um, after I left that position, I ended up leading a department at another nonprofit and we were moving the marketing from and the fundraising from being um, grant based so that they were diversifying their funding source so that they could have more individual donors, major gift donors, event donors, et cetera. Because just like if you're doing financial planning or if you're doing sales or if you're bringing in new clients on the corporate side, you always want to have a diversity in where your funding is coming from. It's the same thing in nonprofits. And so they needed somebody to really lead those efforts. And they also needed somebody to lead marketing because they had none. So I did an entire branding scheme, website launch, et cetera. But again, no formal training. I would just be like, oh, there's a free workshop on marketing for nonprofits. Here's a free workshop on social media for nonprofits. Here's a, I just like went to a million things and figured it out myself. So that's it. And then I ended up switching over to corporate marketing because I needed, you know, to get paid. It's weird. <laughs> Food, you know, housing. Paying my bills, paying my mortgage. It's kind of important. So there you go. Yeah. So let me ask you one more question as we wrap up our chat today. What's exciting you about the future? 
what are you what are you looking forward to you know outside of post covid world whatever that may look like <laughs> uh i mean personally i'm excited to travel more um i used to travel a lot before in the before times so mm-hmm. that will be delightful um professionally for vision advertising. I'm really excited about this next chapter. We're hiring for three positions right now. Um, so that is very exciting. Um, I'm excited to have more in-person meetings and, um, do more public speaking in person because I'm like a level 10 extrovert and I miss people. So I'm speaking at a big conference in a few months. I'm having more in-person meetings in general. And I just, I really need to fill up that battery like selfishly, I really need to do that. Um, I don't think and... you're alone in that. <laughs> it's back to uh, the hybrid conversation from earlier. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm excited that, you know, the kind of new world that we're in at least opens up options to do, like we said, more hybrid things. So I can have conversations with people on the West Coast and I can sell to the West Coast with actually without flying to the West Coast, which is great. But then I can drive to Connecticut and sell in person. So mm-hmm. it just opens things up in a new, exciting way. And I'm glad that we're not moving backwards with video chat because sometimes you kind of want to wear sweatpants when you're in a business meeting. I mean, when you're watching any of this, who knows what kind of pants any of us are wearing? Let's be perfectly <laughs> honest about it. We and call the it honest, a business mullet. I mean, it's right now. on top, sweatpants yeah. on the bottom. I, I will say I am wearing orange sweatpants that you, neither of you and those of you listening will never see in person. There it is. It's on record. Well, this was, go. this was very interesting. I think you've, you've brought um, a different perspective than some other owners that we've chatted with, um, you know, in terms of how you approach some of these challenges we all experience. So I want to thank you for your time. As you mentioned earlier, you guys are hiring and your website is vision.advertising.com. So vision-advertising.com. Dash excuse me, vision dash. I have it written down. I said the wrong word. Um, but I know. So where people can connect with you after the podcast, if they want to connect is in the LinkedIn, the Twitter, the Instagram, all three of those suckers. Um, yeah. And then uh, your company LinkedIn as well. I also have yes. listed. So this was yep. great. So thank you so much. Um, that's it, everyone. If you've learned something today or laughed, tell somebody about the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.